you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Here on The New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put, is the science of change, as well as careers, community, research, and COVID-19. We're happy you're tuning in. My guest this morning is Dr. M.K. Brown. Thanks for joining me this morning. It is good to hear from you. Just briefly, I'll inform my audience about you. Dr. Brown grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and after graduating high school, moved to central New York to pursue an undergraduate degree at Hamilton College. Here, Dr. Brown became interested in organic chemistry by working in the labs of Ian Rosenstein. Upon graduation, Professor Brown moved to Boston College and received his PhD in organic chemistry with Professor Amir Hovela in 2008. After completion of his graduate studies, he began a Ruth L. Kirschenstein National Institutes of Health funded postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratories of the Chemistry Nobel Laureate E.J. Corey at Harvard University. In 2011, Dr. Brown joined the faculty at Indiana University. Please welcome Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for joining me today. It is good to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. So, what have been your long-standing interests in the field of science? So, for, for me as an organic chemist, I'm really interested in the synthesis of complex organic-based molecules. And one of the, the, the long-standing interests that, I'm, that I'd like to, that I'm trying to pursue within my career is trying to develop uh, uh, ways in which we can do scalable synthesis of complex molecules. Oftentimes complex organic molecules are very difficult to prepare in sufficient quantities. Uh, this is important mainly for the pharmaceutical industry as complex organic molecules are often used as drugs to tr- treat a variety of human ailment, ailments. So I'd like to be able to d- uh, think about ways and develop ways in which we can try and make these uh, important molecules on, on large scale. Okay, yeah, that's very good, it's very good. Um, So how do you maintain a view of the bigger picture in your career and in your life in general? So while my my interest scientifically at least is thinking about uh, scalable total synthesis, one of the the bigger picture things that I think about at least as as being somebody um, at a university is actually training of graduate students. Uh, Oftentimes my students, proceed to careers in the chemical industry, oftentimes in the pharmaceutical industry. So I see as one of the the primary drivers of what I do here is to train students to ultimately go into those careers and there also make uh, significant advances um, in whatever uh, field that they choose uh, to to be in. And honestly, it's one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, the positions uh, that my students get um, once they leave my group. And I, I love to see them develop over the years um, and, and doing fantastic things. Yeah, that's very good. And that's very important as well. So how have you maintained vision and teamwork in your environment? So um, how do you maintain that? Yeah, so teamwork, I, I think uh, a lot of it is uh, having a lot of group events. So um, whether that's just group meetings where I, I constantly talk to my students, uh, we always are I'm always walking through lab, talking to students about the research, and I often like to have several students sort of talk together. Um, I think that sort of br- brings together sort of a collegial uh, environment. When students know what other students are doing within the group, they can often you know, help each other try and solve some of the diff- difficult problems uh, that they have. And, and one of the things that I, I think is also important, not only is scientifically you know, trying to advance here through a collaborative effort, but also like trying to have some fun with this, right? So we do like to have some group activities and yeah. uh, do fun things outside of outside of the lab because you know we're, we're all people and we like to you know to do other things. And so trying to um, get to know your lab mates on maybe a more of a, a deeper level, not just on the, the purely scientific uh, level. So I think sort of the combination of those two things. So you know, it's it's perhaps cl- cliche to say this, but we like to to work hard and in lab but also play hard and you know and, and, and have fun with each other 
That's good. That's good. Um, so if you had to describe one aspect or one feature that complemented to your success as a student and now as a professor, what would you say? How have you been so successful as a student and now a professor? Um, so one of the things that I, I, I try and do is, is to keep really excited about what, what it is my job. Like, I mean, I, I absolutely love what I do. And so it, it, it's not hard for me to spend enormous amounts of time thinking about science and talking to students like I, I don't, I don't mind it. I don't, I don't get uh, burnt out that easily <laughs> from, okay. from spending a lot of time on this. And I, I think for me that, that that just keeps me driving, keeps pushing forward. Like I'm always thinking about the the next steps of a project, or talking to students about the next step of a project, or even at the end of a student's PhD, I'm thinking about well, what kind of careers can they pursue? How can I help them achieve what they want to achieve in life? So it's it's. It's just, yeah, an absolute passion for, for science, frankly. <laughs> that okay. I, I, I just, I really like what I do. And so it's, it's, it's yeah, it's not hard to, to work hard. Yeah, that's good. It's good when you enjoy your work. So what have been your most effective and impactful ideas to date? If you had to sum it up. What? Um, so from, a, from a scientific standpoint, uh, the, the developments that have been going on in my, my group. So as I mentioned, we like to think about developing scalable synthesis of complex molecules. And the strategy that's been uh, being investigated in my group for the last nine years or so since I started is actually thinking about what are called alkene functionalization reactions. So alkenes are, are ubiquitous functional group in organic chemistry. And we try and use those in interesting ways to build molecular complexity very quickly with very simple starting materials. And, um, we are certainly not the only ones that, that work in this area, but I think some of the contributions that my group has made um, in the area of what are called cycloaddition reactions, which are a way to functionalize alkene, and also in the ways of transition metal catalysis um, are unique and powerful ways to transform the alkene, which is a simple organic molecule, into something much more uh, complicated, which is what is a way in which we think we can uh, make complicated molecules very quickly. Okay. So also, Dr. Brown, I saw that you did some work in alkyl boration, so some borane chemistry. So what led you to work in that, work in that area or work with those compounds? Yeah, so we, we wanted to try and develop generally effective ways to functionalize alkenes. And there's several ways in which you can go about that. You can develop lots of different specific reactions to functionalize each alkene, to put two different groups, to add two different groups at each position of the alkene. Um, while we became interested in, in boration reactions is that it allows us to put in a carbon group, like an aryl group or an alkyl group, but also a boron group. And the reason that the boron is important is because it's well known that there's a lot of reactions in which you can transform the carbon boron bond mm -hmm. into a variety of other bonds like oxygen, nitrogen, and halogens. Mm -hmm. And so in doing so, when we do a, what's called a carboboration reaction, it allows us to do one simple reaction and then diversify the product of that reaction in many, many interesting ways, uh, taking advantage of the idea of using a carboboration uh, reaction. So that's been really effective in our group uh, over the last seven years or so since that reaction was uh, discovered within our group. Uh, to oh, okay. So also uh, along the same lines of boring chemistry, um, would you say, this is just a, a quick question, would you say uh, that you, have you ever used in your lab hydroboration oxidation? Uh, we don't, but we have used hydroboration oxidation. Uh, we have certainly used the, the second part of that, the oxidation aspect okay. is something that we use quite frequently in our group. So yeah, we are drawing a lot on sort of the chemistry that uh, um, has been developed for, for, for years, right? Since like the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that, that, that type of reaction is still important uh, today without question. Okay, that's good. So given all of your responsibilities and accomplishments, how do you maintain a balanced life? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that I do, <laughs> okay. Okay. but I, you know, maybe one thing I'll, I'll comment to that is my, in, uh, being an assistant professor 
is is a lot of fun, right? I, I get to come in and, and essentially do whatever I want, you know, <laughs> and, but it's also d difficult largely for that same reason, right? Is that sometimes you don't necessarily have direction. Um, and so early on in being an assistant professor, uh, since you don't have a lot of direction, a lot of people and myself included just think that the, the more I work, the better things are gonna get. Like if I just keep dedicating time, more time, more time, right? But we all have only a finite amount of time. There's only so many hours within a day. And so you often sacrifice other aspects of your life and trying to like dedicate everything to one specific cause. And in my case, it was, you know, being an assistant professor, trying to get tenure and advance in, in academia. Something that I've uh, come to appreciate over the years as I've uh, been in this job now, now nine years and progressed through tenure is, is having a balanced life is actually leads to more, pro to, to greater productivity. Um, so, you know, early in my assistant professor days, I didn't necessarily exercise all that much. Um, I think I, I didn't spend as much time as I wanted, perhaps with my, my family, especially my, my young children at that time. But now I exercise more, I spend a lot more time with my family, and I feel like my productivity is actually uh, increased yes. um, as, as a result of that. And so it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard to make that switch. And I, I, I completely understand it when assistant professors just say that they, they work a lot and they have to try and you know advance the next step. But I, I don't think that has to be the way. I think you can achieve balance and, and one can be uh, uh, productive. And so I'm certainly trying to work to that. I'm not perfect, but um, it's something I've learned, uh, especially over the last several years. So to have a, a balanced life leads to more to, to greater productivity. Yeah, that's very true. And one thing I've learned um, when it comes to balance, balance is perspective even though there is a general baseline for what you would consider to be balance, mm -hmm. balance many times is respective to the person mm -hmm. in terms of what I'm working on and what I find, what I'm able to rest doing and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that that's absolutely true. And like, you know, people have different interests, right? You know, they have different commitments in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it, balance is not the same for everybody, right? And exactly, as you, exactly as you said. Yeah, it's very true. So, how did you find or how are you seeking to find the right environment for you to thrive scientifically and intellectually? Um, I think having a collaborative environment is, is one thing that, that I try and strive for within my group. And, and as I mentioned before, I think a lot of that is through uh, students working together to achieve a common goal. And the, the, and the, everyone has their individual research projects within the group, but we are working together as a unit to to keep things moving forward. And, and, a, and a lot of sort of the, the, the overarching goal to keep a research lab running is, is it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it's true, is that money is driving science, right? And so there are grant cycles that we do have to hit every five years or so. And so everybody in the group is trying to produce, uh, you know, really excellent uh, research, not, not only for their own careers and advancement of themselves and advancement of sort of the greater societal good of just developing interesting uh, reactions, but also trying to develop things that are exciting enough to the broader synthetic, the broader organic chemistry community, such that we can get another round of funding and continue um, what we're doing. So as I mentioned before, like having a collaborative environment, everyone working together towards a common goal, I think it's really important uh, to, 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 to do that, yeah. Yeah, so synergy is important. Want that common, the common expression, the one plus one equals three, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, what were some of the highlights? If you had to list a few of the highlights, what were some of the highlights of you working with the Chemistry Nobel Laureate E.J. Corey? What were some of your highlights? Um, you know, working with, with, with Professor Corey, some of the, the highlights really were um, uh, just talking to him about science. So, he'd always come down to my lab, you know, every day or two, and he would, we'd just start talking about science and we wouldn't necessarily talk about the research that was going on uh, at that very time within my fume hood, but he'd often just sort of sit down at the desk next to me and just start talking about uh, some idea he had or just sort of wanted to get my input on something that he had, had read. And he'd always sit down next to me and he'd have a, the, this uh, uh, file just of papers and he'd always just sort of sit down and just start writing um, stuff and we just sort of talk, ch chat about whatever he wanted to talk about and so um, I thought that was really exciting that 
he just wanted to talk about science and it was just about science fairly broadly um, as well. And so I've tried to take some of those types of ideas and actually translate that to uh, my, my current group and just trying to talk to my group about science as much as possible, you know, not necessarily about their project, but just sort of about um, things or, or topics in, in, in organic chemistry. Yeah, that's good. So I, I think it's really an enthusiasm for science is probably like the, the biggest thing I've taken away. I mean, Professor Corey is now 90 years old and he's still going strong. So it's, that's commendable. Yeah. So why did you choose chemistry as a field to major in? In your undergraduate and then later on, why did you choose chemistry? So a, a lot of it comes down to uh, problem solving. I really like the idea of problem solving and, and I like trying to approach problems in a logical way and I felt chemistry, uh, I could do that, right? I mean, we, we can't see molecules, but we certainly have a lot of ways to detect molecules. And um, I like being able to think about things in a molecular level and trying to devise solutions on, on, on that. I think that's really interesting. And organic chemistry in particular, I, I found to be really exciting uh, from a problem solving aspect of, of it. So that sort of started in my sophomore organic chemistry classes. I started to get into research uh, fairly early on as a uh, sophomore and junior and ultimately a senior. Um, and that really translated into uh, graduate school where I think my like love of organic chemistry really sort of hit in uh, first year of uh, uh, graduate school. And it was largely due to my, my mentor in uh, graduate school, Professor uh, Amir Hoveda. He, he really sort of um, was just super excited about science and that really was uh, inspiring to me and, and, and carried me forward. That's good. So if you had to give advice some advice to those wanting to pursue the field you're currently studying in. What advice would you give if you had to give some advice? You know, I, I tell this to a lot of incoming graduate students, especially ones that come for like a recruiting weekend, is that you, you have to love chemistry, especially organic chemistry, to try and pursue a PhD in organic chemistry. It's this, uh, graduate school is, is difficult. Um, it's and, and it should be, to, to, you know, because you're trying to achieve the, the highest degree that our field offers, right? It should be, a, a, you know, it should challenge you. Um, obviously, in a safe way, it should challenge you, but it should certainly challenge you. Um, and so the graduate school is, is very difficult, but it can also be a lot of fun. And the way it can be a lot of fun is that if you really just love what you're doing, if you come in every day and you're like, I really want to set up this reaction or I want to try and solve this difficult problem, it's, it's not that bad if you really, if you really, really like it. If you don't really like uh, uh, chemistry or organic chemistry specifically uh, in, in my field, then it's going to be really difficult. Coming in every day, setting up that reaction, it's just not going to be a lot of fun. And, you're gonna, and, it's gonna, and I, I, I would not recommend it. So at, at graduate school is a choice that um, should not be made lightly. It's something where you should really sort of think, think, think deeply about it before you get involved in it and then um, once you've realized that you're you're all in, then I think graduate school can be a lot of fun and enjoyable uh, ex experience. And, and it's not certainly something you have to appreciate um, on day one. Like you might think you really like chemistry, you show up to graduate school and you realize that maybe it's not for you. Maybe organic chemistry isn't something that you want to spend the rest of your life doing. And that's totally fine as well. You don't have to. Um, there are plenty of other options for, for students, but the overarching thing, like the, the base thing that you need to do in order to like pursue a PhD in organic chemistry, in my opinion, is to, is to love uh, science and, and what you do. That's good. That's good. So as we wrap up, what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I think the thing that, um, some of the most beneficial advice really is actually to be cautious of uh, unsolicited ad advice. Um, and what that really means is to sort of seek out your mentors uh, and, and trusted sources of advice, you know, in, in this community and, and this probably attains to most fields as well, but you know, you can be casually talking to somebody about whatever it is you're talking about, but they can start listing all sorts of things that you should be doing. Um, but then if you talk to somebody else, they'll list you like all these other things that you should be doing. Right. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very uh, difficult to sort of like please all those people because they can often have conflicting advices and it can just be very difficult. So I think it's really important to sort of seek out your mentors, 
ask for specific points of advice and then try and act on those if you think those are, are important. But, but I mean, the overarching idea here is that just sort of be cautious about like trying to listen to everybody and trying to get advice from everybody I think can be uh, uh, somewhat dangerous um, uh, in, in my opinion. Yes, I agree because you know, as I think back, um, one of my relatives would say they hear, they listen to people's advice, but they take what's in it for them. Yeah. So they take the portion of advice that's related to what they need to or what they agree with based on their understanding and their situation. So yeah. there are a whole list of parameters or a litany of factors that you go through. Of course, you want to make sure you hear people out and understand their perspective, but you want to make sure what they say is related to what you're going. Yeah, exactly. And I especially learned this in being an assistant professor. Like, you talk to 10 different people, they'll give you 10 different ways in which you can sort of proceed through being an assistant professor. And, like, you know, maybe only one of those pertains to sort of your style of doing research. So, there are many ways to achieve success in a field, many, many ways. Like, and so you kind of have to find your own way and, and seek out the people that um, you think can give you trusted, uh, good advice that is specific. To, to your needs um, yeah that's good that's good well thank you dr brown thanks for coming on the show it's much appreciated it's much appreciated thanks for listening we're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I.